Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you will apply to a particular school being highlighted, you should listen to all of the episodes as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Lastly, if you have any questions you'd like me to cover on future episodes or any comments you'd like to share, please email me at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. And don't forget to visit our website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Pete Sines, who's the Assistant Director of Admissions at Boston University. Pete, thank you so much for being here today. I can't wait to hear all about what Boston University has to offer. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, John. Thanks so much for having me today. Very excited to be here. Well, it is our pleasure and honor. So, Pete, let me ask you, what is it about Boston University that makes it so appealing for so many students to want to apply and ultimately attend? Oh, my gosh, John. That's the question of the year, if there ever was one. What isn't it? I would start (laughs) off by asking in return. I think it's a little bit of everything. Our value and return on investment, breadth of opportunities, both in and outside the classroom. Our location, especially. I love to tell students that I work with directly that we are in the heart of a major metropolitan hub, but are still a traditional college campus to come back to. So we have that fine line walked on our end but especially being a large university as well as a residential community, especially with diversity and inclusivity as part of our values. So I think it's really truthfully a little bit of everything on our end. We bring a lot to the table for students, no matter what they might be thinking about. Well, that's a terrific introduction. I also want to add that I read a statistic recently that well over 90% of the freshman class returned. So your retention rate is really something to be proud of. So congratulations to you and the entire BU family. Pete, what could you tell us about life on campus outside of the classroom? We have over a couple hundred different engagement opportunities for students when we're looking at extracurricular involvement. So when it comes to being a large university, we have divisional athletics. We also have club sports and intramural sports. We have our Agonis Arena right on campus for students residentially to make the most of, especially being right there. But I would say on top of that, we have anything and everything as a large university from campus ministry, Greek life for everything there, from social, panhellenic, pre-professional and academic organizations, even a co-ed community service fraternity. So it's not just something for every student to be a part of, but especially a couple different some things for students to be a part. We kick everything off in terms of our extracurricular opportunities on campus each year on our Nickerson field with an event called Splash. So you can see it online. It really showcases it very well as to filling up an entire football field, soccer field that goes ahead and from field post to field post shows exactly all the different types of clubs, organizations, anything and everything, our beekeeper society, our cheese lover (laughs) society, our kendo association. So really it's a great opportunity to not just see it, but especially feel what there is to be a part of and where you can find your community on campus. Well, I know a lot of students that are currently at BU and, of course, many that have graduated, yeah. and there's been nothing but positive feedback from the students. Many of them come back to visit, and we talk about their experiences. So, again, it's the great work that you do in admissions to make sure that you accept the right students, but also all of the great programs that you offer in your classrooms and beyond to make sure that students are happy there for their four years and more. So thank you so much, and congrats again on all the great work that you do, Pete. Thank you. Let's dig a little bit deeper into your application process, Pete, if you don't mind. How many applications do you actually review a year? And do you review applications based on region, intended major, or by high school? Any insight that you could share would be greatly appreciated as students and their parents want to know 
what happens once they hit submit? Of course. And thanks so much for the question, John. So on our end, we review as an office, depending on the year, I'd say last year is the most up-to-date frame of reference, about 81,000 applications for first year consideration. So it's a lot of times a very busy reading season for a lot of our staff. And so we do read by territory, but I would say most readers on RN are going to read anywhere between 2,500 to 3,000 applications each and every cycle, as we like to call it on RN. But when it comes to our reading assignments, it is territory based. So that's a great question there. We'll go ahead and read based on our territories assigned. So we pride ourselves as much as possible to be the experts in our respective fields as to reading for the schools that we're visiting firsthand, seeing the colleagues on site within those college counseling and guidance counseling offices to make sure we're in the know as much as possible when it comes to updates within the school, classes that are offered, grade scales that might be adjusted, things like that. But we're the ones that are visiting as well as advocating for those students throughout our committee based process. When it comes to the file reading, it is a very detail-oriented process on our end. So we'll be those first readers, so to speak, with our territories assigned, and then navigate the file through that process. So it usually is looked at by a couple different staff members within our office, and then overall as a committee-based decision at the end of the day. Most of our staff members, in terms of our process, having a review of the application, as well as going ahead and being on the same page with the file reading parameters and process. Well, thank you so much for the comprehensive answer. We truly appreciate it. And Pete, I received the following question from one of our listeners from our email opt-in list. So the next question is going to be asked by Tracy from New Jersey. Tracy from New Jersey, please go ahead. Thanks, John. Uh, My question is in two parts. Is it possible to request being reconsidered when a student receives a rejection from a school? And secondly, what actions should a student take if they are deferred from a school that they really want to attend? Yeah, so I would say that is a great question to ask, Tracy, no matter what schools you're applying to and hearing back from. It's always going to depend on that school's respective process and their admissions criteria. In my experience in admissions, it's best to continue the conversation. So to clarify with your point of contact, your admissions counselor, what next steps are available. When it comes to our process, we never like to say deny, but we will have to sometimes have what we like to consider a non-admit conversation with students. So it's never a no, only ever a not right now or not yet. We'll navigate that conversation with them. So if it might be a non-admit for the first year application, we're able to go ahead and move forward with the process of potentially reapplying to Boston University as a transfer applicant. Once some institutional coursework comes under the belt of the student and they're able to really strengthen their profile in terms of academic performance with that college or university coursework, or if it might be a student that is deferred, they are continuing that conversation, knowing exactly where they stand in the process. They will want to make sure they go ahead and have the most up-to-date information and materials on file within that office. So that can be things along the lines of up-to-date academics, senior year performance, mid-year grades, quarter grades, or trimester grades. It might be an additional letter of recommendation if the point of contact within the office says that could potentially strengthen the application on a qualitative side of things. If they might want a letter of continued interest, it's sometimes called. If the student might be in a position where a waitlist invitation is offered, if they might need to confirm that or accept that invitation to tentatively go from there. So I would say at the end of the day, it always depends on the school and process, but continuing the conversation, clarifying with the point of contact exactly where you stand is usually a safe first foot to step out on. Well, thank you again for that comprehensive response, Pete. We really appreciate it. And of course, I also want to thank Tracy from New Jersey for asking the question. If anyone is interested in joining the email opt-in list so that you may receive episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other great resources, please sign up by clicking the link in the show notes or visit my website at www.collegeadmissionstalk.com. So Pete, do you use the student's high school GPA as indicated on their transcript or do you recalculate it using your own metrics? And if so, what are you looking for from a student's academic record and how do you evaluate them? Yeah, so that's a great question, John. So on our end, we do not formally recalculate a student's GPA. So the GPA listed within the kind of context of the high school or secondary school is kind of like our base camp, kind of like our starting line as to where we'll go ahead and tee things off in terms of our academic review. 
from there, that's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. We'll go ahead and do a deeper dive to see exactly what that means. So we'll go ahead and look at, a, say, a GPA and see, is that on a 4.0 scale, potentially higher, depending on the school, maybe depending on the state. We'll go ahead and review what that means precisely in terms of the weighting procedures and parameters at the high school when it comes to some rigorous classes like advanced placement, dual enrollment, Cambridge, honors level course, international baccalaureate. So we'll really do a deep dive, particularly to understand when we're looking at a GPA exactly what that means and represents in terms of the academic profile with the student. From there, we'll go ahead and apply that context. So we're going ahead and not looking at the student based on just that number, just that GPA. It is a holistic review process within our office in terms of the application criteria and review process. But we have a better understanding, especially when we see multiple applicants from the same school, as to exactly what those side by side mean. Not that they're competing against each other, but we want to make sure we're advocating for them, again, as the points of contact with our territory assignments so we can present them better to our admissions committee and in our advocacy process and things of that sort. Hey, John, this is Olivia from Boston College. The most meaningful part of my experience with Dormify is the huge range of tips and tricks for college, whether it's what not to forget for move-in, 10 things to ask yourself before picking a college, five pieces of advice I wish I heard before freshman year, and so much more. Dormify is there for you no matter where you are in your college experience, and it's really amazing to feel so supported by a brand that I love. I highly recommend anyone beginning their college journey to head over to Dormify for all things college tips, tricks, and content. Thank you, John. Thank you, Olivia, for introducing Dormify to our listeners. Dormify is a one-stop shop for stylish and functional dorm decor, offering a wide range of stylish and functional products for anyone looking to decorate their dorms or small spaces. From bedding to wall decorating to storage solutions, Dormify has everything you need to transform your living space into a comfortable and stylish home away from home. Use our exclusive coupon code College Talk. That's one word, College Talk, to save 15% on most products when you shop at Dormify.com or through the link provided in the show notes. Please note that if you make a purchase through the affiliate link or coupon code we provided, the podcast will receive a small commission from Dormify. But rest assured, we would only promote products that we truly believe in and think will benefit our listeners. And now, back to the show. Well, that's great insight. And Pete, I was also curious, do you know the percentage of in-state, out-of-state, and even international students that attend BU? And how does the admissions process differ for each of them? Yeah, so that's a great question. So kind of working backwards, we are very much so a diverse and inclusive community on campus. So we truthfully have about 24% of our undergraduate population from all over the world, international populations. We have about 130 countries represented on campus. So we love to make the most of that as a very diverse community. But all the while, when it comes to our in-state and out-of-state numbers, we're not a state institution. So we don't have a different process for applicants from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It is the same and consistent review process, whether you're in-state or out-of-state. Sometimes an extra step or two with international applicants for things like academic records being translated to English for our processing team or an English proficiency exam as part of our process there as well. But when it comes to things like our in-state and our out-of-state applicants, applicants from here within the United States in most cases, it's the same review process. It's the same decision making. So a student isn't at a leg up or a leg down no matter the process. We see a sizable amount of our applicant pool, truth be told, coming from Massachusetts, but by no way, shape, or form are they always our PAC leaders. We see a sizable amount of applicant interest from New York, especially as well. Love to hear that. But also go ahead and see a lot of applicants from California, too. So truthfully, all over the U.S. as well as all over the world. But when we're looking at those hard percentages, that's kind of the breakdown and shakeout. Yeah. Well, that's terrific, Pete. Thank you again. And what is the average profile of the current freshman class? Yeah, so truth be told, on our end, our average unweighted GPA from this past year was about a 3.8. So when we circle back on exactly what that means, that was kind of our starting point on the 4.0 scale before weight or rigor was applied in terms of the context of the academic review. When we'll go ahead and look at things like standardized test scores, we are a test optional institution. And I'm happy to report we have just got approval to go ahead and be test optional up until the spring 2026 entry term. So very excited to share that update on our end. But when we look at standardized testing, we truthfully don't report the testing parameters with that test optional consideration in mind. 
So any number we would report would just be the test scores we know about, some students potentially above, some students potentially below, but on our end, we don't have that average test score. We'll see applicants competitively apply with somewhere around, I would say, a 1,200 to all the way up to a 1,600 standardized test score on the SAT. So if you have a perfect score, my professional recommendation would go ahead and apply with the inclusion of that test score. But if and only if in every other example, you feel as though that's a good indicator of what you're bringing academically to the table. And that's a score you're proud of, you were excited to get back, and you definitely want to include in your application. Review. If you want to apply test optional, more than welcome to do so. That is the same review process within our office, just without that test score, we're taking a closer look at the other application materials throughout our review. Thank you, Pete. And if a student falls below the middle 50%, what are some of the things that they can do to enhance their overall application? Sure. My starting point, I would say, was don't panic. Plenty of students above those margins, plenty of students below those margins, case in point with what we were just chatting to. A lot of times that might be in factoring in the test optional consideration. So that might not even be everybody. That might just be the folks that went ahead and applied with their test scores. So that's an important clarifier. But I have a colleague that loves to say you should never see or hear a number as a reason not to apply. So I would say take that with a grain of salt, tentatively go from there. In terms of strengthening the profile, I would say going ahead and making sure they're putting their best foot forward in the other aspects of the application process. So I would say they can really focus in on case in point senior year performance, making sure they are as academically competitive as possible with that, especially in mind underway. They can also make the most of those qualitative parts of the application. So the letters of recommendation, the personal statement, if there might be a supplemental essay factored into that individual school, really making sure they're as competitive on those fronts so that they can really in the big picture and holistic review shine through that process, especially with that school's decision making in mind. Well, we really appreciate that. And what are some of the things that students do to demonstrate their interest in attending BU? And Pete, is that something that you track as part of your overall admissions process? Sure. So it is, I would say, monitored, but it isn't tracked in the sense of our admissions conversation. So it won't make or break ever a decision within our office. But when we say track, we do that to make sure we're doing our jobs to the best of our ability. We want to factor in our marketing and communications plan. We want to, as much as possible, wherever possible, hopefully answer questions before they're even asked and in abundance if able. So with that, we'll go ahead and try to go ahead and monitor interest based on our communications and our marketing to make sure programs of interest are making their way to students and the application process and updates and things of that sort are being delivered and that news is being relayed. So on our end, when we are looking at that demonstrated interest component as part of our marketing and communications plan, we do not factor that demonstrated interest in terms of our application process, but we'll want to make sure that those messages are being relayed to students through things like call campaigns, email correspondence, for things along the lines of on our end when we're travel planning and making sure we're visiting schools where we see prominent amounts of interest in terms of where applications are making their way to us from, we want to go ahead and use that information. And that's how we get that information in a lot of cases. We appreciate that. And I was also curious, Pete, the Common App has a general essay prompt with seven different options that students have to choose from. My curiosity is about the supplemental essays, which I know BU asked for. In those supplemental essays, what exactly are you looking for beyond the general essay and anything else that's in the overall application? Yeah, so that's a great question, John. So on our end, we do have a supplemental essay for students to go ahead and complete as a requirement with their BU application. That's a 250 word prompt that really directly asks, what about being a student at Boston University most excites at you? So with that, there are no wrong answers. We don't have a cookie cutter BU student, so we don't have a cookie cutter response to that question. We're really, again, with that kind of demonstrated interest potentially in mind, looking to see how we made a student's college list, what they're most excited about in terms of being a part of on our campus. Is it a particular club or organization, potentially a sport? Is it an academic opportunity or opportunities? If a student might be between two different programs or thinking about double majoring, in, across colleges on our end, or if they might be thinking about dual degreeing within the same school or college, we really wanna know where they see themselves fitting in so we can better advocate for them within our office as to knowing where they'll be focusing in on in terms of joining our campus communities. So that's our supplemental essay. When we're looking at those more than anything, I would say we're focusing in on authenticity. We wanna make sure the student is honest. They know what they're in for at BU. They understand how and where they're gonna fit into the different aspects of our community, but really wanna make sure no matter what, that's genuine and circumstantial and specific to the student. That's really what we're looking for in our. 
Thanks, Pete, and I appreciate you explaining that what you're looking for is that the students understand what they're looking for in Boston University. Mm -hmm. We talked about demonstrated interest earlier, but I guess the supplemental is asking the students to demonstrate their understanding of BU and how they see themselves at the school on that campus and in which programs. Is that correct, Pete? That's correct. I couldn't have said it better myself, John. So there's no wrong answer to that question. We have a lot of schools in the Boston vicinity. About 25% of the city of Boston is in an undergraduate or graduate program. So it's a lot of folks in the city itself, a lot of great schools in the city and around and outside the city as well. We want to know why us in particular. We want to know what separates us from other schools. They don't have to name any other names. We're on a great train line with another Boston area school. We're right across the river from a couple of great schools in Boston, but really want to know what separates us in their college search. Well, that's a great point, and I think it's really important for the students to understand that when they write the supplemental essay, it needs to be specific to that school to demonstrate their understanding of what the school offers and why they see themselves there. Using a general essay when prompted to write a supplemental is not the best use of that part of the application. So again, we appreciate that, Pete. And let me ask, what are the different ways one can apply to BU? And is there a benefit to applying one way over the other? It's a great question. So there are a couple different ways students can go ahead and apply, John. The most popular option for students to go ahead and make the most of in terms of the application review is the common application, which most students are likely familiar with. It's kind of like the Facebook of applying to several schools. You set up a master account, you almost friend individual schools, and then go ahead and complete those respective prompts and questions from there. But on R, we are a member of the common application. So students can use that master account to add individual schools, case in point with BU, complete those questions in that essay, and then go ahead and apply from there. Now, a couple of programs on our end might have an extra step, potentially an extra requirement or two. Like I know our Questrom School of Business, as well as our College of Engineering, will take a little bit of a closer look at math performance in high school specifically and want to see with the College of Engineering specifically calculus to be a class that's either completed or underway senior year. Our Questrom School of Business has the same requirement with just a smidge more flexibility. It needs to either be calculus or pre-calculus with AP statistics. But all in all, that's something to make sure that students are going to be in their comfort level when push comes to shove on campus in terms of the academic curriculum and the course load. But some other programs like our College of Fine Arts will factor in an audition or a portfolio review, depending on if it's a performing arts program or if it might be a visual arts program as part of the review process. So performance being our school of theater, our school of music, as well as our visual arts programs have that portfolio. But when we're looking at the process and the timetable, we have a couple different buzzwords, a couple different dates, deadlines to be familiar with throughout the process. So on our end, we have an early decision deadline, which is traditionally right around November 1st. That's our early decision round one deadline. We also have an early decision round two deadline, which is the same deadline as our regular decision deadline, which is usually right around early January. This year was on January 4th. When we're looking at those deadlines and those differences, the biggest difference is going to be return time time, turnaround time, when students are going to hear back from us in terms of their decision, that'll go hand in hand with the type of deadline they apply for. For something like early decision, that is a binding process enforced by the institution, telling the institution as the applicant that, hey, you can count on seeing me in the fall. If I'm admitted, I will be joining the campus community, go Terriers. We love to see that, but if and only if BU is their dream school. They know no matter where else they're admitted, what other programs of entry they're offered, any particular financial aid or scholarships applicable, they're comfortable making that big commitment because it is binding at the end of the day. That's a quicker turnaround time. I know I mentioned in terms of early decision, we look to release those decisions right around middle of December and about six weeks after that early November deadline. With early decision round two, we're targeting middle of February for our decision release there for the same six weeks. So smaller applicant pool, but not necessarily the entirety of our applicant pool. We'll see about 42% of our first year class be filled by way of early decision applicants. For folks that want to take a little bit more time to make the best possible decision for them, we do have the option to apply regular decision, which is where we'll see the bulk of our applicant pool, but also see the bulk of our incoming first year class at about 58%. So with that in mind, that deadline again was January 4th, usually early January, pretty consistently year to year. But students are able to go ahead and apply by that deadline. It does take a little bit more time as our bulk of our application pool, but we look to release those decisions tr traditionally right around the middle of March. So we take a little bit more time, but students are able to apply as many regular decision schools as they'd like. That keeps those options open. So no matter what, the student is making the best possible decision. 
In terms of benefits, beyond the time frame, students can go ahead and make the most of the timetable based on their individual schools. Most schools will traditionally align in terms of dates and deadlines in my experience, but all the while with that, they can go ahead and make sure that they're applying for their program of interest, meeting those deadlines for applicable scholarships, considerations, and things of that sort that make sure they're putting their best foot forward throughout the process there. When I look at early decision applicants, when we look at early decision applicants in our office, it can sometimes be a little bit of a competitive edge. So when we look at the overall time frame, especially with the bulk of our application pool in mind, we'll go ahead and see a lot of students apply early decision round one, almost like they're going ahead and getting in front of the applicant pool, demonstrating that interest, setting the bar for other folks. That's a great boat to be in in that example. Some students like to apply early decision once they've taken some time to maybe think on it, early decision round two taking some time to go ahead and think on it. So that gives them that option there. So really we are on the student's schedule with whatever works best for them. Can sometimes be a competitive edge for early decision, edge for early decision but gives them that time frame to work with if they want to take some more time to think on, understanding that it is binding. So it's a little bit there. Well, we appreciate the explanation of the different ways to apply and the benefits specific to each. And I absolutely love that you compare the Common App to the Facebook of the overall Common Application process. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much for that. And Pete, with the increase in schools going test optional and the ease with which to apply, thanks to things such as the Common App, the Coalition App, schools are obviously receiving far more applications than ever before. As admissions professionals, how do you determine the number of applicants to accept, waitlist, and even deny when you receive far more applications from deserving candidates than seats available? Oh, that's a great question as well, John. So on our end, it comes down to not just our office, particularly our senior leadership within our office, but our institutional research department on campus. They very much are partners on that endeavor, especially monitoring year to year, data points to data points, exactly how many applications are coming in, but especially with growth at the university, different programs having a certain amount of spots. I would say a great example might even be being in an urban location on our end. Housing, I want to make sure no matter what, as an institution that requires first-year students to live on campus and still guarantees housing all the way through four years of study, we want to make sure no matter what, everybody always has a space on the residential side to call their own at BU. So it's a lot of data tracking. It's a lot of number following. They'll go ahead and monitor that. It's a little bit like algebra. So they're trying to solve for X and solve for Y. So they're trying to go ahead and see how many offers of admission they can extend to the most impressive candidates across the board all over the world. Still understanding that maybe not everybody might end up coming to BU, but we can still get the most amount of impressive candidates coming to BU and still not what we call overbook or over enroll. Want to make sure no matter what, we don't have any majors that might be impacted as it's sometimes called, where they can't necessarily always guarantee for years graduation so we try to get in front of that as much as possible there with that data tracking and that number tracking. well we appreciate that and we spoke about the test optional nature of the application process and of course boston university like many other schools is in fact test optional in fact you indicated pete that you'll be test optional at least through 2026 could you tell me the number of students that applied and that were ultimately admitted that did not in fact submit their test scores yeah, and that's a great question. So on our end, it's usually right around 50-50. So we're test optional right now up until spring 2026 as the entry term. So with that in mind, we last year as the most recent frame of reference saw almost 50% of our students apply without the inclusion of their standardized test score. So when it looks at the final count, that's our starting point with application volume. We truthfully saw our incoming first year class, 50% of our students there as well, came in having applied with the inclusion of their test scores. So I tell students all the time, very honestly, very candidly, that if it wasn't for test optional or score optional, I probably wouldn't have been able to go to college, truthfully. So if you're taking the SAT or the ACT, more than likely you've got double what my senior year scores are. Congratulations on that, or were, excuse me. But with that all in mind, I would say if you feel as though that's a great indicator of who you are and what you're proud of and you want to factor into the application, that's great. If not, no worries at all. We're just going to take a closer look at those other application comments. But usually on our end, to circle back, it's about a 50-50 split. So plenty of apply with, plenty of apply without. Well, thank you for sharing that data and the great insight. If you fall within the 50%, certainly consider submitting your scores, but also taking into account what you said earlier in terms of the middle 50%, the test scores in that range are probably higher than they used to be because students now have the option to submit their scores or not. 
So only the best of scores are being taken into account in that middle 50% range. So the point about being mindful of what that middle 50% range really means is very important in the overall application process. So thank you so much for that, Pete. We appreciate it. Sure. And if a student visits Boston University, what are some of the sites they absolutely must visit? And what are some examples of questions they should be asking to help determine whether or not BU is in fact the right school for them? Yeah, so I would say great question, John. So my favorite spot on campus, don't tell the other spots I said this, is our Rhett statue. Rhett is our mascot. He's got a great statue right next to our visitor center. He's very photogenic. He's a strong silent type though, but he's always great for his selfie. So that's a great starting point. Visitor center just so happens to be right there. If you'd like to pop in for a tour while on campus, but I would say right across the way there on both sides, you'll see behind you on the statue bench is the Charles River. That's a great view, but right down the street, you'll also see our BU Beach. So we've got Adirondack chairs out, especially weather permitting, of course. It's always great to go ahead and take a seat out there. You can watch folks on the river. The Charles River Esplanade is right there. So you'll see plenty of folks biking and running right there. It's great, especially in season, but it's a nice little catch your breath spot on campus, especially. Right down from there is our Marsh Plaza. So it's right next to our Marsh Chapel. It's very scenic, it's very beautiful. And that really is a great example and focal point of campus to see exactly how urban we are, but also how residential we are. If you look to your left while on the plaza and you're facing the Green Line train, so the T in Boston goes right through the heart of our campus. It's a great case in points above ground where we're located to feel how exactly close we are and aren't to the city of Boston. You can be downtown within minutes, but still have that traditional campus come back to train being right there. But on our end, that's a great focal point of campus, Marsh Plaza. And I would say as you're kind of right in that general vicinity, you can hop on the T, maybe make your way to West Campus right up the street. We have three different T stops on the green line for students to make the most of, BU Central, BU East, and BU West. So that'll go ahead and take you wherever you need to go on campus. But the T will especially take you anywhere you'd like to go in the city of Boston. So I'm a huge Red Sox fan. I would have to say, while on a New York podcast, but I would say with that, especially we go ahead and have students plenty of make their way to Fenway Park for concerts throughout the year, especially during baseball season for baseball games and have $9 student tickets for Red Sox game, including Yankee games. Wow. $9 Boston versus Yankee tickets. That is amazing. Yeah. And we've even had students during the World Series actually make the most of that. It's a great program for sure. But I would say a lot of students love making the most of that, especially, or going into the city. The Seaport District is wonderful. I'm partial to Cambridge, as well as the North End, which is the Boston version of like Little Italy. So there's a lot of different hotspots in and around the city to make the most of, especially. But you can always start on campus and always make your way back to campus pretty easily as well. Well, that's fantastic. And I have been to Boston many times and it is a great city to visit for sure. Yeah. But I have to be honest with you, Pete, I don't think you're going to get a Boston versus New York Yankees game at Yankee Stadium for $9, even if you're a student. Yeah, that's a tough sell for sure. It's nice to have that. It's a perk for a lot of students. So that's terrific, Pete. And what are some examples of college essays that really stuck with you? And what advice would you provide students getting ready to sit down to write their essays? That's a great question. So I would say if you're still in the brainstorming process, say something about you that nobody can say about themselves or in a way that nobody can say about themselves. There's a lot of times shared experience among 17 and 18 year olds, nothing wrong with that, but you can really make it your own by talking about how you grew and how you were impacted by a particular event if you feel so inclined. I would say speak to your passions. I'm a pretty excitable guy to begin with, but if you're excited to write about it, we'll be as excited, if not maybe even more excited, to not just read it to ourselves, but read it to our colleagues and have those conversations in terms of our committee discussions and our advocacy committees and things like that. So really a lot of times in my experience, finding your topic tends to be the hardest part. That's why I think it's great that Common Application has several prompts, including that final kind of like choose your own adventure prompt at the very end there. So really take your time to think how to best go ahead and go about writing your essay, speaking to who you are throughout the process. And again, that authenticity piece. I would say great essays that I've read here recently in terms of our file review. I had an applicant a couple of weeks ago that went ahead and opened just right off the cuff, strong open with uh, by saying, I am a llama photographer. And I can remember exactly where I was in my office, leaning up in my chair, just thinking to myself, go on you know so that just right <laughs> off the cuff was a great opener i felt i uh, recently had a student that went ahead and used terrier as an acronym 
kind of like in a love Nat King Cole type way to describe everything in their BUSA specifically that they were most excited about. So I would say make it your own as kind of a final destination, but finding that way to make it your own is probably the best advice I'd have for students. I would say what not to do is almost as important as what to do. So I would say, take a look at that essay, take another look at that essay, make sure you're really confident and comfortable putting that foot forward, and that's the best foot to be put forward in terms of the application review. If you're comfortable having maybe a parent or a family member or a guardian, take a look at that, give you some notes there. Constructive feedback is great to have, even from maybe a guidance counselor, college counselor, or potentially even an English teacher. I would say spell check, especially 2023. It's a beautiful time, especially with edits in mind, but make sure you're putting your best foot forward there as well. But really making sure you kind of dotted those I's, crossed those T's, and gone through it with a fine tooth comb is going to be the best way to make sure you are putting that best foot forward. Well, we really appreciate that. And thank you so much for sharing examples of what to do and what not to do. That's terrific. We spoke about how you truly do have something for everyone at Boston University. So, Pete, what could you tell us about the programs that you have for students that may have had an IEP while in high school to help ensure that they continue to be successful once they're on your campus? Yeah, that's a great question as well, John. So on our end, again, we are a diverse as well as an inclusive community. There are several different resources for students to make the most of, no matter what needs they might have or where they're coming in, depending on their secondary school or high school environment. We want to make sure we parallel those wherever possible and as much as possible. A couple of big ones right off the bat that I would recommend are our Educational Resource Center, our Writing Center, so particularly with students knowing full well folks are coming in from all over the world. We might have a lot of different writing abilities coming in. We want to make sure everybody everywhere has that open environment for them to really get edits and notes, speaking of the essays there as well, in terms of their college academic homework and assignments. We also have our disability as well as our access services, which is primarily focused on those needs being met as well. If it might be a student that has an IEP or a 504, brought to the table throughout their application process or as they're considering enrolling at BU or even after that point, they're able to go ahead and make sure any services are provided there. A lot of times students will make the most of services provided directly through their professors. So each and every professor has an office on campus where they offer office hours. So if a student might not be entirely comfortable going ahead and asking a question in class, they're always more than welcome to stop by those office hours to make sure that question's answered on a one-on-one -on -one basis and potentially more thoroughly is there as well. So a couple different layers for that. Well, that's terrific. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And of course, I'm going to include the link to the Office of Undergraduate Admissions to Boston University in our show notes. If there's anything else that you want me to share with the students and their parents, please provide it to me. And of course, I'll make it available in the podcast show notes. So this has been a thorough and great conversation, Pete. Thank you so much. But unfortunately, it leads us to our last question, which is, what are your top three pieces of advice that you would give a student and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? Oh, that's a great question, John. I would say no matter what kind of in order navigating the application cycle, number one, I would advise students as well as parents, family members, anybody involved in those college decisions, applications, and conversations, keep those options open. Your first choice can sometimes be your last choice at the end of the process, depending on decisions, depending on scholarships, depending on program entries and things of that sort. Majors can change. So I tell students that I work with all the time that undecided has a tendency to be the most popular major in America. America. So we want to make sure no matter what, students are putting their best foot forward there. If things do change, maybe they might not. But I would say with that, keep those options open. Number two is a big ask, and it's a huge leap of faith, but I would say trust the process. We are admissions professionals. I tell students we work in the Office of Admissions, not the Office of Denials. We want you to be admitted to BU, but more than anything, we want to make sure you find the right school for you and you are as successful as humanly possible wherever you decide on. So I would say with that, that's really our process. We want to make sure students are trusting this process. They understand what those deadlines mean and maybe might not mean, and they're putting their best foot forward wherever they're thinking. And especially with that in mind, number three would be something my mom loves to say. She had a career in higher education. She's a gardener. So I'm going to stick with that theme. And she loves to say, bloom where you're planted. So I think no matter what, you will get into college. I can say I know no matter what, you'll get into college. It's a matter of finding the right college or university for you and making the most of that experience. 
get involved. You don't have to stay involved necessarily, but put yourself out there. Anything you think might be of interest, go to those events like we mentioned on our end, that splash on Nickerson Field. Make sure you know what's out there. Resource referral is a huge part of this process. So knowing who a point of contact is and going through with knowing your advisor and where their office is located, getting to know your floor mates and your hall mates and your resident advisor as well. But I would say ask questions. Everybody everywhere is in the exact same spot. They've never gone from high school to college or university before either. Everybody has the same questions. Some people are asking them. Some people aren't. Some people are asking them a little bit more often and maybe a little bit more loudly. But really make sure no matter what, you make the most of the services, resources, organizations, and that overall experience. So that's that bloom where you plant. Well, those are tremendous pieces of advice. And I absolutely love your mom saying bloom where you are planted. By the way, Pete, my father-in-law is a landscaper, so I'm definitely going to be using that saying. <laughs> Pete, thank you so much for your insight, your advice, and your time today. We really appreciate it as it will help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the college admissions process. Can't thank you enough, and I really hope to have you again soon. So thanks so much, John. Really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcasts. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap.